Hello and welcome to another oral chat episode distributed by the headliner magazine UK. In this one, we have two experienced engineers in mixing hundreds of stems in a single song. We'll pick their brand on how they prepare their sessions, how they make decisions, and if they ever deleted a couple of stems just to make life easier. Joined here with us, Kevin McCombs and William Robertson. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you doing this morning? Fantastic. So, if, if, Kevin, you're in uh, LA at the moment? I am, yeah. I just got in from Nashville yesterday morning. So you're just going back and forth between Nashville and LA a lot, I guess? I am, yeah. Okay. Every two weeks or so, yeah. So you're working for like two production houses. What's the reason for going back and forth? Uh, so the producer that I, I work with every single day uh, moved his family to Nashville last May. Um, and and so we, we just take projects in both locations. Um, I, you know, it, it depends. I just spent 10 weeks in Nashville and we're about to spend the entire summer here in LA. So it, it just depends on the record. Wonderful. William, you're in London, I guess. Yeah, still in London indeed. Yeah, living in a studio now, just upstairs actually of the studio so yeah i'm not moving until we fix these atc amps unfortunately <laughs> so yeah apart from that yeah it's all good <laughs> yeah watch your back with the heavy duty machinery yeah it's just just dive into into this one it's uh about dance mixes right so not dance as a, the edm but dance as a lot of stuff happening in a mix in a song so Theoretically, we have a dummy head over here in our lab, we call him Frank, and Frank helps us out a lot when we do these kind of thought experiments and stuff like that. So let's assume Frank would start mixing records, right? At some point, he will get, um, you know, well, a job for mixing 300 stamps or more, maybe. So what are the two things that he should absolutely do or maybe even check before he accepts the job offering. What are the two main things that you guys uh, you know, consider in these kind of situations? Maybe Kevin, you can start? Sure. Um, typically, uh, any song that, that we end up mixing um, with a track count that high is is because we are the ones responsible for the production that size. So it's, it's kind of already in our session where we're not you know, just receiving 400 stems out of the blue from from someone else. Um, however, it's you know it's not inconceivable that we'll uh, receive track counts that high. And yeah, before we receive it, we just have to make sure that um, you know everything is labeled. If it's you know audio six or or whatever, it'll take several hours to just go through and identify what's even going on, and you know color code everything in the session, set it up to where you know, it looks like any other session, but just a larger version of that. Um, and, mm -hmm. and then, you know, once everything is kind of in place, then you can really just apply the same philosophy as you would to any mix. You know, um, we always start with the drums, move on to the low end vocal and then the mid range. And mm -hmm. um, after that process is, is repeated a few times, you know, the, the mix can kind of be refined and then you head into automation and transitions mm -hmm. and that, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But but largely it's it's the same. Um, mm -hmm. w William, do you also get responsible for the 300 stems or <laughs> the ketamine? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, it's true that it's sometimes part of uh, our own craft that it becomes to pile up, end up piling up like 300 tracks. It's true. But it happens also sometimes that I receive uh, that much. Maybe 300, maybe the max I probably receive actually, not n never more than that for a normal music, not for a movie or stuff like that, just for normal like streaming music, we can say. And uh, I actually completely agree uh, with the point uh, here because it's the same thing because in the end you will end up having buses that groups all these tracks together so when you mix it, when you mix with these buses, it's in the end it strips down the mix to a manageable amount of tracks. So in the end it becomes almost being like a normal mix, we can say with a normal amount of track that you would expect. The only thing is 
it gets complicated when you're in on the production team, of course, it gets complicated to have all these layers working well together because it's a thing to bust a lot of stuff together and then mix it. But if you bust a lot of stuff that don't work together very well, in the end, it's going to be a big mess. It's almost like if you recorded something but badly or not at all, the recording doesn't fit the song, you end up fighting it. And it's the same here, except that you recorded 15 things no, badly in a way and you're piling them up and in the end you're like ah, realizing that it's not good. Would it make sense for our Frank uh, to consider firstly maybe okay what are the labels what are the actual stems uh, and then maybe before even you know start clicking away um, kind of design the project um, in a mind map or something like what goes together how, how to approach it how to break it down essentially is is that a step that is like important? Will it save time? What, what, what do you think, William? I think it's mandatory in that sense. Otherwise, you will end up scrolling down and realizing like, oh, damn, 252 is muted. I wanted it. And it, it's just, it's a mess. And if you don't know where it's burst, well, if, you, if it, that 252 track doesn't have a color that makes sense to you or a name, if it's just called Audio One, it's a pain, really. So you, yeah, definitely labeling stuff properly and color coding stuff properly is mandatory. Like it's, I cannot imagine doing it without it. Do, do you, Kevin, by any chance have like a separate uh, notebook or um, a Word file or Excel or whatever to kind of keep things organized or do you just, you know, trust that you can put all the information you need, all the metadata for yourself inside the session? It's really different for every session. Um, so for for the most part, um, I, I just have to go on a track by track or, or sort of track category kind of basis. Um, it, I will say that the thing that we end up doing that makes it the most digestible from the start is um, finding multiple sources that just constitute one sound. So if, if it's rhythm guitars, if there's three microphones per side, um and you know there's a left and right of one tone a left and right of another tone and a left and right of a third tone really it's it's just one sound so if i end up bussing those things together even before it'll hit my sort of like higher order uh, mm -hmm. buses that are that are there in in every single mix um then i can start to go ahead and like commit immediately and print things down um because once i settle on a balance between you know um a 57 and a ribbon mic on a guitar cab then i i don't really ever want to think about that again and um ultimately i will end up bouncing down you know something that could be 12 microphones into one stereo track um mm. and then you know disable and hide them out of my session and in case i need them for whatever reason later but for the most part um yeah, being organized and then committing as soon as possible to the decisions that you make is the only way that you'll keep your head above water when you're <laughs> when you're dealing with um, with track counts this high. Uh, uh -huh. In fact, we uh, two weeks ago, I, I think we hit a a new personal record for our mixes, um, including all of the demo production that had to be referenced for. Um, for the mix that we were doing and, and everything involved, it ended up being 440 tracks, um, which that is a lot. Yeah, in the abstract is perhaps even too many. Um, but it, and, it, does beg, it begs the question, you know, can, can you run that out of a laptop? You know, it's the, the, there is so many things happening if you're using plugins and, and a ton of plugins probably. Uh, this thing can, you know, run out of power quite quickly, I think. Uh, that is very true. So for the same reason um, that I brought up, you know, committing levels into stereo files, that will also commit any processing that you have on the individual mono tracks. Mm. Um, so, so long as you have a good compass as you're working the entire time um, and, and you trust the decisions that you're making, you're not working until, you know, three four in the morning on on something that you've been at all day um 
so long as you trust yourself and the decisions that you're making, you can commit to things um, and that will reduce the load on the CPU. That being said, uh, we run either a, a desktop or a laptop setup, but the uh, computing power wise, they're, they're almost identical. Um, but the, the thing that we have that allows us to deal with track counts that high, especially when it comes to like vocal stacks where you have to have a plug and chain on each individual channel, um, is lots of universal audio stuff, which is effectively just a second set of computers just for plugins. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, between those two things, uh, committing to processing, um, and having something external to your computer also crunching the numbers. Uh, I mean, you max out on CPU on every session, no matter what. Like if, even if you're not trying to do so, it will fill the shape it, of whatever happen. container you give it. Yeah. So, w w William, we've talked about hybrid mixing like two years ago, I think. Um, and, and you're probably doing that a lot still. Yeah. Uh, so in, in a case of a, like a real dance mix, when you have a lot of things, how do you make decisions? What are you going to you know, take out to the board and, and put it back? Um, do you do that kind of like early on into the project, knowing what's coming or will it just, you know, leave it till the end and then maybe just do the final processing? What's it depends your on, that? on what you what you mean when you say taking out, do you mean muting tracks or committing to something? S sending to analog and back, yeah. Ah, sending to analog and back. Uh, it's actually the same kind of mindset as Kevin has, is uh, you commit to a bunch of uh, processing and make a stereo track out of a bunch of tracks. You know, it's the same kind of mindset, except of instead of UAD plugins, it's hardware, but actually it works exactly in the same way. And it makes it, easy also to manage and also uh, it's hard to have that when you have a lot of track but I, I like my session to be easy for the cpu which is never the case when you got the that much plugins so i, I really feel relieved when i i can play back the track with all these tracks stacked together and there is no hiccups I, so i really struggle to get that right and for that i'm I'm open to like print a lot of stuff. Actually, like, recently I did something that it's, it's, it's risky, but it's still not surgery. So it's not a big, big risk per se, but I, I decided to commit the whole drums to a pair of stereo track. And it's something that it's, yeah, it's scary in a way, but in the end it up very well, working very well because I used to like, for instance, the artist after I did that, I committed the, the drums to 1178 and stuff like that. And the artist asked, oh, can we have a little bit more kick? I was like, damn. And actually the, the easiest way was just to bring back the original kick drum. And since uh, I committed to the 1178 on the Avid HDX system, it was a line in terms of sample and, you know, and phase, because if you don't have that, like if you have normal Pro Tools, it will be a bit late, a bit delay. And if you are not aligning track back in, if I, for instance, I brought back the kick drum uh, according to the drum print, it would be a bit out of phase and would be very hard to manage. So that makes it easy also. And yeah, I just brought the original kick and just push it. And if I wanted less, that's where it gets tricky because it's, it gets sketchy in a way, but I just brought the original kick and flipped the phase and just put it a little bit in and it actually works <laughs> very well, except, except the only time it won't work is if they ask less room or less, you know, that kind of thing, like you cannot go away with it. Because when you're flipping the phase of the kick drum, for instance, to reduce his volume, it's still going to be present in the room. It's just going to be a bit further away in a way. So yeah, it's not exactly like reducing the fader. So that's the kind of thing I do sometimes, but that's the most extreme I've done, like printing a whole drums, because I felt that I really liked that the, what the compressor was doing. There were a lot of tracks. My computer was was dying pretty much, was burning out. And, ev and all the rest, the vocals and stuff were so precious to the artist. And he wasn't so precious about the drums that I thought that's the only way really. And I could obviously not travel with an 1178 with me all the time. So 
that was the way also to record mixes that big everywhere because it has been a struggle also with these kind of mixes if they are so heavy with the cpu that printing to analog helps you to actually free cpus uh, for the computer and be able to recall the mixes everywhere like wherever you can go and be more flexible instead of struggling with recalling outboard gear because this is really not flexible and it's hard to maintain that workflow in 2022 actually so that's how i do you guys mix on your own do you have a producer there or a team helping you out uh, with decisions what to put together how to commit you know, you just managed you need to commit to something in order to get to the end of this right so do you just take these decisions on your own or, or is there somebody that you can talk to uh, and maybe help you out a little bit so you don't get um you know too much out of the out of the line maybe kevin you can answer that sure um uh i work with uh the producer colin Britton every single day and we're intimately involved in in every single project and in fact we do a lot of co-mixing um so you know i'll sit down at 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 a mix you know between the hours of 10 at night and four in the morning and then he'll come in in the morning and do tweaks and then we'll we'll kind of go back and forth but for the most part we trust each other but there is that system of checks and balances where um you know we uh we have to agree on you know the snare reverb and all of these things but for the most part we we get along and we make decisions sort of hand in hand um where we're we're both interested in the same thing which is that the mix you know sounds awesome and modern or wh whatever it needs to be based on the project that we're working on mm -hmm. um but yeah very much uh involved at every step of the process and uh the thing that varies is how involved the artist is in um you know the mixing process some are a lot more heavy-handed others don't want to be a part of the process at all and just want and, to and what is uh, like a better version for you guys is it better to have an artist there or, or is it you know just uh a little too much noise let's say um my preference is always to get an entire version out before we sort of deep okay. dive with you know um hey i i remember this synth in layer 250 that i i would love to be able to hear a little more yeah absolutely mm -hmm. no problem but the um, the overall sort of scheme of, of how the mix comes together. Um, artists in the room won't typically have the same um, vision of something if you press play on on the, the stems before it is mixed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, our, our job is to sort of see the sculpture in the block of marble and then chisel away every, everything that that doesn't look like a sculpture um mm. and so i think it it needs to sufficiently look and feel the the way that it should um before that that kind of input is um is that valuable because mm. it, it it needs to to sound like the song um without any you know obnoxious volume differences or, or like mm things aren't panned properly the way they should be or, or transitions aren't, you know, um, those are the kinds of things that bother artists and casual listen listeners more than anything. And at no point in the process does anyone need to hear it that way, basically, other than the mixer who's responsible for making it not, not be that mm -hmm. way. So William, when you come down or mix down to, to these few buses, how how does the session look at uh look like you know when you really start mixing the you know final touches when you have everything sorted out all the buses are there you've made the decision for this reverb and etc um and you really start you know placing the instruments panning instruments you know doing the final soundscape right how does the session look like is it still like 20 or more buses or do you trim it down to six five four mm. i don't know that's a good question because it de it depends of course but most of the time it's still quite a lot of buses of course and also it's buses going to buses <laughs> and going to the mixed bus at the end so it's a lot of it's a mountain and different scales of processing and uh actually i think 
when you got a lot of tracks, it's probably not the best, but the easiest way for me to approach mixing. Because at, when I first started mixing a lot of tracks, I, for instance, I pushed a lot of low end in one element of the bass, and suddenly the, the whole track was weak in terms of low end, but it was still hitting the limiter very loudly because of the lot of bass that that element alone had. And that was a problem. So that's why having a lot of buses, buses sorry, and processing through these buses by little doughs or by different doughs that you put on is actually, I think, the easiest way. So that's why there could be 20 buses. I've, I've never actually counted the buses, but <laughs> they, are, they could be at 20 buses also. And they could go, for instance, to music bus and vocal bus or sometimes drums and bass bus if it's necessary for a certain style of music or even sometimes vocal and background vocal separated and not together on a vocal bus all that kind of stuff but usually it's uh, buses for the main parts like for instance you got guitar rhythm that all the guitars that do the rhythm then you got guitar ads that are called ads which are guitar production stuff we can say like noise in a way, stuff that adds up but are not a part of their self, like something that you can hear but you feel most of the time. After you got different layers of bass, sometimes the real bass, you got the sub bass, you got drums, percussion, you got synths, you got SFX, like transition, whoosh, and all that stuff. You got lead vocal most of the time. I group them together, even the lead, the, the um, chorus and the verse. Background vocals. Sometimes what could be ad-libs, that makes 11. You can have also other layers of synths, which are not synths, but keyboards, like Rhodes, pianos. It's different than synths. It's, it needs to be treated differently. Acoustic guitar sometimes also are independent of the guitar rhythm, so that's 13. Mm. Too many stems crashed Google. Yeah, our uh, our busing structure is actually almost identical to what he described. It just is a mm -hmm. is a wide net that will will catch any kind of production. Where if if you have those buses set up in your template or you know whether or not you tailor them to the song that you're working on, um, you just need to have a place for everything to go that mm -hmm. that makes sense. Where you know you just have to think of it in terms of categories because if if all of these things were just going to the stereo bus mm. uh, it would be an absolute nightmare to say hey the drums need to come down and then you yeah. need to grab 50 faders at the same time and then uh. sc scoot them and jog you know um yeah the the processing on on every bus is also you know largely a a part of what's going to allow you to work with that many tracks mm. um because you don't necessarily want to have um, separate compression settings on on all of the things in the you know in mm. the piano and, and Rhodes bus or or anything mm. like that. It's it's helpful to have sort of a more global processing that mm. um, fits together this category and this frequency range. Um, and you know you can start to think of things condensed down to those sort of like twenty sub buses. Um, mm. and EQ moves made to the buses can end up, you know, towards the end of the process, um, mattering a lot more than what you do on an individual track basis for sure. Mm. So what, what caught my attention a little bit was, or there was a thought, um, how about when you're mixing for Dolby or maybe some kind of surround version and you have that 300 stems, right? So what is, I mean, is there a difference? Can you maybe describe how you would approach a Dolby Atmos mix when you have that, that amount of, of stems? Is it a different approach or do you just go the same roof? Since you do have to position objects uh, around, that's kind of tricky right. maybe a little bit. Um, so I, I will admit, I, I have not done a, a whole lot of Atmos mixing, but the, um, I don't know that my philosophy about it would be any different um, because just in the abstract, 
um, the Dolby Atmos environment is a panning plugin. Um, mm -hmm. It just allows you to take uh, tracks or, in this case, objects and sort of scoot them around um, mm -hmm. in, you know, a version of three-dimensional space as we perceive it. And um, I, I don't know... Uh, obviously, it's another layer of processing that we don't have access to um, mm. in a stereo mix. Um, but the process, in my mind, should be the same. It just determines, you know, hey, is this, you know, vocal reverb throw or anything like that? It would make sense to put this in a spatial place. Um, mm. Whereas, you know, I'm not so sure how useful it would be to have the bass guitar flying around. Mm. Uh, so... It, Largely, um, mixing these things still should come out sounding like music, um, mm. and then you know it just allows you to be creative in the Atmos space for things that make sense to do in that realm. Um, yeah, I, I've I've heard a few Atmos mixes that uh, that we've gotten back uh, that are, are very cinematic in terms of of how things are happening in in space and it it's possible to lose what the song is about because there's too many mm. you know tricks going on um mm. so, so for the most part and it, it depends uh some music is made with atmos in mind and i i mm. think that's that's a very different process than um taking what was once a stereo mix and sort of yeah. upmixing it to atmos mm. Yeah, uh, that, that's uh, extremely important. The, just the approach, or maybe it's just the decision and the beginning of the production. Is this going to be just a stereo mix or stereo song? Or are we pursuing the Atmos version of it and maybe making a decision with the artist and the producer? Are these two versions going to be similar? Or are we just you know letting the, the platform uh, push the mix in whatever way? Right. William, thank you for joining us uh, again. You dropped out there for a second. Yeah, no problem. I changed the browser to uh, another one, and weirdly, I think the camera is darker now. <laughs> I don't know why. It's fine. We're coming to an end anyway, so uh, maybe, William, can you share your approach on, on Dolby Atmos? Would you approach it differently uh, in the light of having 300 stems than having another 15, 20 buses, and then, you know, a request to put that into Dolby Atmos? How would uh, you approach it? Actually, it's, it's inter an interesting question again, because recently I've been to a Dolby big, uh, Atmos room because uh, we have no access to a Dolby Atmos room. And I finally understood the struggle that you can have when there is a lot of buses uh, implied, actually, because for instance, you got one track going to one buses and another one, another one. Like a guitar going to guitar bus, guitar bus going to instrument bus, instrument bus going to mix bus, for example. It's a very rough example. Every processing that you will do, if you do not print it for the final stems of the Dolby, it will sound totally different in the end. And that's a big problem that I uh, realized the guys at the Dolby Atmos room had and I will probably have because I'll probably end up mixing in that room. So I'll probably have the same problem is making sure that when you print the stems, the processing is printed in, which takes a lot more time or n require a more strict workflow in a way with the VCAs in Pro Tools, for instance, instead of the oxes and stuff like that. But that's the main struggle, in my opinion, is the processing in buses to make sure that it's respected, especially when you have mix bus processing implied because on Dolby Atmos the mix bus processing is much different if if non-existent most of the time because of the formats because in the Dolby Atmos I don't, I don't know if you work, know how it works exactly but you got objects you got the 7.1 and you got objects objects are the I think you have I can't remember like a high number of objects we can move like this and that's what the objects are most of the time otherwise you got your bed which is the 7.1 and stuff like that and the objects are not going to the mix bus per se in Pro Tools so when you put processing on the mix bus is not applied to the object so in the end on the mix bus you end up having a limiter and that's it to make sure that it's not clipping 
because of the loudness uh, restriction is a bit different also for Dolby. So the main problem with Dolby, I would say, is the bus processing. Making sure that when you print the stems and you put it, put it back in your session, even not even a Dolby session yet, but just a normal session, it sounds at least very similar to the final mix, the final stereo mix. Otherwise, it's going to be a cat and mouse game, fighting the plugin to print and the one to put back and... And again, the computer is the one that lose in that game again. So yeah, that's that's my thing. Thank you. Uh, guys, we are running out a little bit of time. So uh, thank you very, very much for sharing this uh, kind of unique experience. There's not many mix guys that actually do this kind of things with so many stems. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that with, with Ola and our community. So this episode is distributed by the headliner magazine uh uk which is also present in the usa so both of you guys uh you can check it out once it's released uh next uh, week and of course to all our listeners you're more than welcome to to join uh headliner magazine radio or just find us on on spotify on youtube etc and enjoy debates like this one about mixing, about Dolby Atmos many times, about headphones, of course. We are a headphone manufacturer. Uh, we didn't talk about headphones today anyway, but you both do wear our headphones. Well, so how, how do they do? <laughs> yeah. Is it for, do you, are you talking for Dolby? Because that's a different subject, <laughs> headphones for Dolby. It's a very spicy subject, actually. Subject to a lot of debates. Yeah, that's that's a good term for it. Uh, yeah. Anyone with a room with speakers will uh, tell you it's a bad idea. Anyone who does it on headphones says the room's a bad idea. So yeah, that's yeah. that yeah. kind of sums it up. It, it's it's yeah. I I don't know. It's it's a funny thing. In uh, maybe it's in other industries as well, but in audio, there's always a debate about something versus something. It's always about analog versus digital. It's always about headphones versus whatever. It's always a bass versus guitar. It's always something. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you experienced that, but at least from, from my side, uh, um, the audio industry kind of looks like we're going to have a fight any moment now. <laughs> yeah, it seems to be very heated in that sense. Uh, I don't know if it's only the audio industry, but it's maybe a, a wider actually uh, issues if we can say it's an issue there's the way to divide and stuff like that but in audio we always like also to compare actually that's why you end up having teams because you end up comparing and it's also so subjective that if something like make you feel some specific emotion you get attached to that thing for whatever reason may it be a headphones room or even a compressor sometimes and you think that's the best thing of the world. Like it really resonated in me. And the other guy is like, ah, that's crap. And you almost, you know, you're like, you can, it's almost like he's saying, or she's saying your feelings are crap. And that's why it creates that kind of division and that kind of cleanse, whereas everything should work in concert and together instead of like a fight. But I think that's, that's one of the explanation I could see of why it's always this versus this. And also because it's good for clicks and views, because it's more straightforward. <laughs> That's also a thing. Well, as long as we stay uh, respectful to each yeah. other and support the industry going forward, I think we'll be fine. Mm. Kevin, William, thank you very, very much for this one. Uh, and I hope to do that another time. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, stay thanks safe. a lot. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>